you, Saul, and everyone for uh, your attention today. I really love the last presentation. Uh, well, I mean, you know, and the last one, and the last one, and the last one. So um, I'm kind of now an addict, I admit it. Um, and I, I would like to continue that um, enthusiasm also for bowling, right? I just saw this picture. of I'm from Milwaukee originally, and I was like, bowling? It, it kind of ties in. Uh, anyway, it was not really a big tie. But how many of you um, have uh, ever seen an Atari home console system? Those big clunky things, you know, you could get at home. Well, I'm wondering if you know that in 1980, when the Atari uh, home console system was really uh, in vogue, Atari computer had all, uh, 40, over 40% of the players of Atari uh, consoles were girls and women. That's something I not, a lot of people don't seem to know about. And in fact, um, it, it seems that, that computer games and computer systems were often marketed to families. Um, and, and so this is my little moment of game history before I get into my stories, but it kind of, this is the foundation time when I was growing up, when I was seeing this stuff, and I thought it was talking to me. So I, so I played Millipede and Centipede and a lot of Tempest and all this other stuff. And, you know, and I went to arcades because, you know, this is the kind of way that we actually could see arcades being um, presented to us. So, so, uh, so I'm kind of, I, I, a lot of my work, I work against stereotypes. And um, for me, uh, that's transitioned into some of the research I'm going to talk about today, um, as well as, uh, as a, a lot of the other stories uh, here. I have three main stories, but first, one more little nugget of game history. Um, 1983. Okay, this is 30 years ago now. Sorry, everyone. Uh, or is it 40? I don't know. It's a long... <laughs> it's 30 years ago. Okay, does anyone know this game? Cubert. Yes, Cubert. All right, so Cubert, you know, the 1983, people were experimenting with games. There were women programming games. There were often families playing these games. Games were very different, and, and how we understood them in culture were very different. Now let's go on to what I think of as the beginning of the dark ages of computer game design, which was 1993. 1993, Doom came out, and I am a player of Doom. I played Doom, Network Doom, and you kind of had to to work in the game industry and kind of, uh, uh, you know, get along with your colleagues who were all men. Um, but um, but I, I do think that this is the moment when computer games became shooter games. Like, they're, they're, that, that, that lumping together of those classified, you know, those, those classifiers really changed the way we think about games. You know, I think a lot of you, if I talk to you, oh, of games, you're like, oh, I don't play games. Well, I'm a board game designer, a card game designer. I started out as a digital game designer and, and started doing other kinds of design work. I designed sports. So, so thinking about games, games are really a part of all of us. And now we have some really beautiful games. If you haven't heard of Journey, it won many awards last year. It's just an in interesting independent game by a company called That Game Company out of LA, and it's just some beautiful kind of uh, impressionistic work. We're seeing experimentation. We are over the dark ages of video games and on to a new era. Ca uh, casual games and iPad games have a lot to do with that, but I think also an increasingly diverse selection of people who are making games comes into uh, the, the fray. But let's get started with my stories. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a girl, uh, technology, and a conversation. So three three small um, points. One is a girl. So sometimes, and, and, and I want to talk throughout my talk about unintended consequences. When we make things, they have consequences, and often we can't see all of those consequences. So I just want to think about that as a rumination as we go through this material today. So um, uh, I grew up the daughter of a, a factory worker um, in Milwaukee. My dad was from the South Bronx, and my grandfather, um, his father had died a homeless man before I was born. And I, um, I was really a sick kid. I was uh, asthmatic, and I always went to the hospital and um, was really scared at hospitals and, um, you know, I was really young. And went through a lot of medical stuff. And w one thing we did at the hospital was play card games to keep the time going by. And when I hung out with my family members when I would come home, we played games as a kind of family thing. And many of us probably have that, that, that pattern. You know, games give us something to do together. Games can frame some interesting conversations. But also, games really can provide a, a, new, a new kind of world for us, a new kind of imagination. And so, so I think that, for me, games allowed my family to, co to, um, to connect and to dream big because there's a fantasy world there. You can be anyone you want to be in a game, even a simple card game. So they're powerful, and they're powerful tools for change. And so the story of my story is only one way that games changed me. 
and help me get along with my family, help tensions go, go and become a little bit less at home. But also, they, the games can change people in really powerful ways. And I like to use them as sites for transformation. So uh, one last little note about my history. Uh, I, I started off doing game design and did a lot of educational game design in the 1990s. And in the 1990s, you know, 20 years after the invention of uh, a lot of these uh, console games and early uh, computer game industry as it existed, we didn't know anything about how people played. No one studied games, no one talked about them. These were, this was a learning game for the, for the Discovery Channel that I produced. And you know, I have to say, we, I would see kids play this game. It was made for middle schoolers. People would get in this boat. It was called Nile Passage to Egypt. And you would get in this boat, and some players would you know, turn around in the boat and take pictures and write little logs about what they were seeing. And some players would get in the boat, and they would go to the end of the river. And we didn't actually make the game a go to the end of the river game. It wasn't that kind of game. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> People just are using this as a race game. A vehicle means a race game. There are all these cues in this game. So um, it, I started to really ask questions about, well, how do we know what kids are learning from this? And, and who are our players? And why do I notice girls and boys are playing differently? And all these other kinds of play. There's a lot of questions that kept me um, asking questions, moved me into, uh, into academia, where I run a game design research lab to do this kind of work. So I think games are special. I think they're sites of transformation. And I also um, I really try to get evidence for what games are doing um, in the world today. So my question for us um, is how can we move people to be an effective force for change for themselves and for the welfare of others? You know, games are complex systems that create experiences. They actually model systems quite well. They're really great systems tools, systems thinking. And, and um, that's what I'm really concerned with in, in my work. So I want to talk about two separate uh, projects um, and, and, and just give you a sense of the story behind them. This, this idea about technology, you know, we, uh, there's a big push for learning and technology and all kinds of technology. How much do we really know about games and technology? And I want to just show you a little bit about a public health project I worked on a few years ago. This is a POX game. It's called POX Save the People. And it, um, it uh, deals with disease spread, and you start, uh, players play together in a cooperative way to stop the spread of disease um, on the board game. So it was a game originally commissioned by a public health group who asked if we could make um, not yet another vaccination brochure. So it's actually supposed to um, promote vaccination. Um, and we made a digital version of the game. <laughs> Yeah, this is a hard question, right? Can you make a vaccination game? This is not what a game designer hopes is going to be actually. But it's, it was actually a great project. But I did imagine needles chasing you and like all this. OK. So, so we made this game, and, we, and then um, and my team, um, I engaged a lot of students in my lab at Dartmouth College, and we, um, we created a, a, an iPad version of the game. And then you know, we were showing it to some people who do board game design, and they're like, oh, you should make a zombie version. And we're like, all right. So we made a zombie version of the game. So we had these three versions of game. <laughs> And um, um, what we did was we, we conducted randomized control trial or control experiments across all three versions of the game. I have two psychologists who work in my lab, and we decided to say, well, what, what is going on? So the games are about the same size. We ran, we ran the studies where they were played in the same situations, and they, with the people, there were two people across from each other playing the game, and we really got some really interesting um, ideas about what the games were doing differently. In short, Players of the zombie game actually valued vaccination more in, the, in, our, in our study results. And I can go into this offline, but, but pretty interesting stuff about not only valuing vaccination, but they also learned higher levels of systems thinking in the zombie version. These are exactly the same games, OK? How come the digital version is not doing as well? These are big questions for us as innovators and technologists in the room. You know, um, how this really works, how the power of fiction might be actually liberating us to do something new and to be exposed to new ideas. This is a provocative point I'd like to pose to you. Um, so the point about my story about technology is that we need to know far more about the nuances of this material. OK, I thought if I'm going to talk about games, I better have you play a game, right? So I, <laughs> I want to talk about how a game can actually change a conversation. And um, this is a game called Buffalo. And what the game is about is it's, you have to name a person living or dead, fictional or real, or you know, 
live, uh, you know, I guess real is a fine word in this situation, who matches the criteria on the following cards. This is a card game. Okay, ready? Bill Nye, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Bing, 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 bing. Wow, that was fast. Okay, good. He gets, so he would get these cards. All right, now, now everyone's like, all right, give it to me, give it to me. Rozo. Oh. Do we give it? We give that? We give that? So there's a, there's a cooperative element to um, allow, figuring out who's going to win this. Okay, how about this one? Bono? Batman. Bono. I'm going to go with Bono. I mean, I'm not the arbiter of your, of your game, but anyway. Um, okay, Bono? I mean, I haven't really looked at it. Anyway. Um, female scientist. Of course it's Marie Curie, because no one ever names another woman scientist except for Marie Curie. <laughs> Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, this is good. All right, so, so that's Buffalo. It's played as a card game. There are millions of combinations, and it's a, it's a game we produced as part of National Science Foundation research to actually address biases and stereotypes about women in science, math, technology, and engineering. We started off by making a prototype where we had, like, women, chemists, or women, scientists, and, like, no one could play this game. I mean, it was really <laughs> difficult. So we're like, oh, God, this sucks. You know, we have to make another game. So we, we expanded it. And then what we did is we did some research on this. Now, what's happening in this game? What do you think this game is doing? It's raising awareness. Yes, there's these combinations. You, you, you kind of start to realize, gosh, I don't know if I know a tattooed visionary, per se. Um, <laughs> And maybe I should. Um, but also, an uh, Iranian novelist will come up, and maybe one person won't know an Iranian novelist. Or the combinations are really quite interesting. And how it's working is it confronts people's biases on this, on this kind of outward level, but it also works on an unconscious level. And it's dealing with something called social identity complexity. You know, when you stereotype someone, you might say, oh, she's an artist, and she wears black, and, well, I, I shouldn't talk about myself, but anyway, like, but what if she likes tennis? What do we do with that? That's not a stereotypical way of seeing someone. So, and I think this crowd is a particularly interesting crowd when it comes to um, accepting people and their complexity. And um, I think that that's what this game is really doing. It's opening players' receptive um, channels to people's complex social identities. Now, social identity complexity is a measure of prejudice. And so, in fact, what the game is doing is by increasing social identity complexity, it lowers prejudice. And it does so significantly against the control condition. I have other games that are doing some of this interesting work, um, doing uh, games that uh, in triple associations of women in science after playing games. I do a lot of these games that, that really can deal with deep so, uh, 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 psychological issues and really, through play, be able to bring them into a state of change. And that's something I've really hit on in my research recently that thrills me with such joy, is that we, we actually can change. And we don't always have to even want to change, <laughs> to change some of this kind of really deep-seated stuff. And what could that do for our organizations and our world if we could really help learn to get along with one another? Um, this is a really great, I got a, a picture sent to me from guys who are working on Farmville <laughs> at Zynga. <laughs> and they, they're playing the game. You know, this is really, a, it made me think, ah, you know, now even digital game designers are playing this game. This is really helpful. And then you can see people when they're tweeting, the conversations, you know, I, I played a demo of this game. <laughs> <laughs> And then the response, you know, I couldn't remember um, uh, Sonia Sotomayor for Hispanic Lawyer. And, and so, so this is the conscious level, but again, the games work on this unconscious level. And that's something that I, I found really spectacular and surprising. And in an era where we have a very, very interesting and changing demographic, the only way we're going to be able to innovate is not just if teams tolerate each other, but if they celebrate each other. And that, to me, says we have to come up with some interesting ways to do that kind of work. And I want to end with a quote. Um, I can be a little bit of a technology skeptic, or at least I try to ask questions. I'm not someone who says, ah, yes, gamification. All things will work. Um, <laughs> 
We have un unintended consequences, and we can actually manipulate these things to support our values. And so I urge you all to think about that in the way that you're addressing or coming up with technological uh, challenges, uh, technological solutions to really complex challenges. And um, I, I just want to thank everyone here for your attention and um, the kind community. This is my first BIF. And if you're interested in this work or helping me spread the word or um, you know digging in, I'm, I'm all ears and I'm a, a new learner in the community. So thank you so much.